Hello everyone. In the previous video, I gave an overview of my VFD project. I recommend watching it first. It'll make things much easier to understand. I'll put a link up here on the right. In this video, I'm gonna go over the hardware design process. Choosing the components, building the schematics, and designing the board layout. As a reminder, here's the block diagram of the system. Here's a top view of the PCB. And here are the correlating components of the block diagram on the PCB itself. All right, let's get started. When searching for parts, I look for the highest availability. So I know I'll always have stock if I need it and the lowest cost. But obviously the component needs to meet spec and have a clear datasheet. I'm gonna start with the most significant section of the build and that is the power module that will actually drive my motor. My VFD can control three phase motors. So I needed to build a three phase inverter, which consists of at least six transistors. This VFD was designed for up to two kilowatts when running three phase motors. In my country, I have 220 AC voltage and the typical power factor of a motor this size is around 0.8. With all these parameters known, I now need to calculate the current my power module will need to be able to handle. So with a 220 RMS voltage, and assuming a power factor of 0.8, my continuous current should be around 6.5 amperes RMS. There are times when the current may be higher, for example at startup, when the slip speed is largest. But that high current is only transient and is also mitigated by the VFD because I can start the motor with a slower frequency than the rated frequency, so the slip speed won't be as big initially. I'll leave a link in the description that goes over this point in detail. Earlier, I said that the typical power factor of a motor this size is around 0.8. This parameter is written on the nameplate of induction motors, and the value written is the power factor when the motor is at full load. However, the power factor isn't a constant parameter. It changes with the load. So if I'm loading my motor with half its full load, its power factor will decrease. So why did I use the power factor at full load in the equation when calculating the continuous current? According to the equation, because the power factor is in the denominator, a smaller power factor would mean I would need to handle a higher current. I used the full load power factor in the equation because the highest current consumption of a motor is at full load, despite having a higher power factor. This might seem a bit counterintuitive, so here's a graph which gives an idea of how each parameter changes at different loads after the motor has reached steady state, meaning no transients. We can see that the lower the load, the lower the current, despite having a lower power factor. There's a lot of information about power factors changing with different loads and also how to increase the power factor for different reasons. But I didn't find a lot of information explaining why it changes. Why does a lower load result in a lower power factor? Let's take a short detour to understand why that is. The power factor indicates the relation between reactive power, aka imaginary power, which stems from capacitive or inductive loads, and active power, aka real power, which stems from resistive loads or power that does actual work. So a purely real power would mean a power factor of one, and a purely imaginary power would mean a power factor of zero. Now, imagine the induction motor as a transformer, which it kind of is, where the primary winding is the stator and the secondary winding is the rotor. If the secondary winding isn't connected to anything, meaning there's no load, most of the power is just inductive. We're running current through a coil to magnetize some conductor. So in this case, IM will be much bigger than IE, and the power factor, which is cosine theta, will be close to zero, since theta will be close to 90 degrees. However, once the load on the rotor increases, we're doing real work. We're exerting a mechanical power on the load, and mechanical power is real power. It's measured in watts, as opposed to imaginary power, which is measured in volt amperes. And in a transformer, the primary winding current vector, or phasor, is the vector sum of the no load current vector, IO, and the resulting current vector, IL, due to the load current vector, IS. That was complicated, but I hope you got that. And the more real power the load component is drawing, 
the more we move the resulting main winding phaser toward a resistive load and thus increasing the power factor. Whew, okay, that was a long side note. Let's get back to choosing the power module. I was contemplating between building the inverter from scratch with individual transistors or getting a ready-made motor driver IC. After browsing a bit on LCSC, I finally chose this motor driver IC. It pretty much met my current and voltage demands with good enough turn on and off times. It also offers a few safety features among other things and at the time it only cost around $10. Next up, I needed to get DC voltage from my inverter. So I needed a bridge rectifier which can handle 220 RMS voltages and my continuous current. I found this bridge rectifier which should, with a decent heatsink, handle that current pretty easily. And I needed to filter the bridge rectifier's output with some high voltage capacitors. I first calculated how much capacitance I needed, and for that I used this equation. I found these capacitors, and decided that three of them would be enough, since they're pretty expensive and take up quite a lot of space. Hopefully the voltage drops won't significantly deteriorate the VFD's performance. Having this much capacitance at a high voltage introduces two new issues. First, I need to discharge the capacitors somehow. I don't want them to hold their charge for a long time after the VFD has been turned off. That's how you accidentally get electrocuted. I want the charge to slowly drain within a few minutes. I can't let it drain too quickly, however, otherwise it'll be much harder to charge the capacitors when I am using them. And that's what bleeder resistors are for. I used this calculation to decide how big the bleeder resistor needs to be. And I decided to divide this resistance over a few resistors. That way, each resistor doesn't need to handle too much power, since it's easier to find cheap, high power resistors which have a lower resistance. And I also put an LED which is powered by the charge in the capacitors. That way, it'll warn me if there's any charge still in the capacitors. The other issue that rises from the capacitors is how do I charge them initially? Capacitors, when they're empty, are pretty much a short circuit. I don't want to connect the mains voltage directly to the capacitors when starting. That'll create a huge inrush of current. To mitigate this issue, I decided to initially charge the capacitors using a large high power resistor. And after a while of charging them, bypass this resistor using a relay. I chose this resistor, which can handle 10 times its rated power for five seconds. And I chose this relay since I had it lying around. I have five volts to activate it, instead of the specified 6 volts, but since I need a minimum of 75% of the rated voltage to activate it, 5 volts should be fine. In addition to converting the input AC voltage to high voltage DC for the inverter, I also need lower DC voltages to power my components. So I have an isolated power supply which outputs 5 volts to the low voltage side, and I decided to use the same type of component in my high voltage side for 15 volts since I need that voltage for my IPM, even though it doesn't need to be isolated. I also needed 5 volts in my high voltage side to power the isolators, so I used this DC to DC voltage regulator to step the 15 volts down to 5 volts. There are also two connectors to connect to the motor phases, a fuse for each phase, and a connector to power a 5 volt fan for cooling. And of course there are a lot of peripheral components I didn't go over. They're mainly recommended by the datasheets of the major components. Now let's go over to the low voltage side for a bit. The heart of the low voltage side is the microcontroller, the Atmega328. It has three pairs of PWM outputs, which is what I need to run my inverter, and it has a top clock frequency of 16 MHz, which is fast enough for this application. I also have a few of them, and I'm familiar with them from tinkering with Arduino. To operate that mega at 16 MHz requires an external oscillator and two capacitors among a few other peripherals. In addition, I connected a button to a digital input to configure the motor type, one phase or three phases. I also connected a potentiometer to an analog input to determine the speed. This potentiometer also has a switch built into it. This switch goes to another digital input determining whether the signals to the inverter should be on or off. There are also two LED displays to show the chosen motor configuration, the injected frequency and the measured current. And finally, I'm using eight more digital pins, two inputs for temperature and current sensing, and six PWM outputs for the inverter control. 
these last eight signals pass to and from the high voltage side. And since these areas are isolated from one another, I pass and receive the signals through isolators. These isolators allow me to keep the low voltage and high voltage sides galvanically isolated, yet still pass signals between them. For the PWM signals, I need a relatively high bandwidth isolator to not skew my signals too much. The isolators I chose have a bandwidth of 10 megabits per second. Here's an image showing a signal before and after the isolator. You can see it's like passing the signal through a low pass filter. The rise time is delayed by at least 200 nanoseconds. So I had to account for that when choosing the inverter dead time. I'll go into more detail about that in the software video. That's it for the low voltage side. Now let's go over to the schematics. Okay, we're in the power block right now. Here's the AC input, the rocker switch, the fuse, and the varistor. Here are the isolated AC to DC power modules, and this is the DC to DC module. This is the bridge rectifier. These are the bus capacitors, and these are the bleeding resistors, with the LED showing if there's any charge left in the capacitors. Here's the bypass relay. I'm activating it using a transistor, since it requires a relatively high current compared to what the microcontroller can output, and I also used a flyback diode. And these are some calculations I already talked about regarding the required capacitance and the bleeding resistors. Next up is the IPM block. In the IPM block, aside from the few notes I wrote to myself, the schematics are all from the datasheets application example. Choosing the actual values of the components required quite a lot of reading of the datasheet and the application notes. Now we're in the microcontroller block. These are the ground and voltage connections for the LED displays, and here are their serial connection pins. This is the external oscillator and its capacitors, and the rest are the potentiometer, button, and relay signals, and all the signals going through the isolators. This is the miscellaneous block, showing the fan connector, the motor phases connectors, the potentiometer, and the button. And this is the isolator block. The top two isolators transmit the PWM signals from the microcontroller to the IPM, and the bottom one transmits from the high voltage side the temperature and the measured current. Let's finish with a few notes regarding the layout. Apparently, there's a lot of drama regarding splitting ground planes. From what I understood, as long as I didn't pass any traces between the separated planes, which would generate a lot of unpredicted EMI, and only pass signals through isolators, it shouldn't be an issue. So I decided to do it that way and thus have galvanically isolated ground planes, which seemed better to me, both in terms of safety and in terms of protecting the microcontroller from power surges. I'll leave a link in the description on this topic. Additionally, I made sure the high current traces were wide enough. I put the bulky components all on the same side so it'll be more convenient with the lid. I put a lot of vias connected to the bottom ground plane under the IPM to help conduct as much heat as possible away from it. And I put my logo on both sides, which is extremely important. I also should have added a few test points, which would have helped me while debugging. There's definitely a lot of room for improvement, especially in terms of space used and aesthetics. All right, that's enough for this video. I hope you learned something. Thanks for watching and see you next time.